everyone. Good morning. I'm uh, very excited to be here. And it looks like you're still not working. <laughs> if it is not working in a moment, I will raise my hand when I need the uh, slide changed. Uh, so, hi. Uh, I am, uh, yes, working at Ralph Lauren, but I'm here today uh, really with my customer experience side of the brain. Um, I'm not speaking in behalf of Ralph Lauren today, and I. Um, We'll be you know, talking mostly from a more general customer experience perspective because that's, that's really my passion. Uh, and uh, regardless of whether it's screen, device, online, offline. Is this AI? Is this AI? Is this AI? Al? I think we all talk about what is AI. And there's a lot of um, definitions out there. I don't know that I find any of these particularly helpful myself. Um, they all talk about learning, intelligence, humans, being more like humans. But what does that actually mean? Should we be scared? A lot of the press right now is all about the fear everyone watching, robots taking over. It's interesting timing with Westworld being on and sort of getting reminded of what can happen when technology gets out of control. Uh, but I think we have to temper ourselves because you know, this point uh, that the myths are spreading faster than the technology is advancing uh, is an excellent one because if we don't be careful about uh, getting caught up in these myths and the fears, then the true technology that can really help society and help ourselves and consumers uh, will get out there. We need to help the human. That's really how I think about artificial intelligence. Uh, cognitive systems like Watson were really meant to <coughs> augment human intelligence, not meant to replace us, to work side by side with us, to be our tools. Please help the human. I think many of you in this room are getting already inundated, overloaded completely with information, right? And it's coming faster and faster and faster. Big data is almost all we hear about anymore. And we're needing to be augmented. We're used to it. Every technology uh, that's come along has been something that has augmented us and, and helped us as humans. Think about the wheel. Think about uh, the steam engine and the microprocessor. And I think that's how we need to think about AI is, is really as something that can augment us. It, it doesn't replace us. The future is coming. Uh, I really like this perspective from the, the CEO of TaskRabbit. Uh, in five to 10 years, people will still be using phones, but it will be much more connected world where we're doing a lot of talking to devices and machines. And they are doing a lot of background fulfilling of chores and tasks so that we can live our lives. Doesn't that sound amazing? The future is actually here. And I think that's where the myths and the fear come from. Uh, we've got drones now that are smart and can kill on their own. Uh, the Pentagon is in, and other, I'm sure, countries throughout the world, AI is the centerpiece of their strategy. The future is here. It's not coming in the future. It's now. And we need to be ready for it. Should we care? We can't be ostriches with our heads in the sand. I like Andrew Ng's perspective, currently at Battery Research, the, the huge Chinese search engine uh, founder of Google Brain, relying, thinking about it, like the way the internet came around, where a lot of heads of companies really, you know, thought that they, wish, you know, wished that they had uh, considered the internet sooner. And he says, I think five years from now, there'll be a number of S&P 500 CEOs that will wish they had started thinking earlier about their IA strategy. So I've been talking about customer experience for quite a long time. Uh, four years ago, next slide please, I said, digital and physical are colliding. This is the exact slide I used. It's funny when you look at it now, look at how old that uh, iPad over there on the bottom left looks. All of these technologies, these are all past. At the time when I gave this presentation back then, these were exciting new things that I was you know, talking about. But the thing is, 
the collision has happened. Like I said, it's not the future anymore. We're here. Next slide. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, if you haven't read the uh, Wait But Why article um, on AI, I think it's a, it's a really, really good one. And uh, we're essentially on this reverse cliff where the progress of technology has been moving along and it feels pretty darn fast, especially for those of us like me who you know did not grow up from the early days with a, a, a computer. Uh, it's about to spike. We are right there. And so, again, we need to be prepared. Uh, so now what? What do we do to prepare? Well, I'll talk briefly about eight tips for creating AI experiences. AI experiences that fundamentally help all of us, businesses, society, humans, the world. The first tip is to focus on the humans. This is the most important thing in order to keep us in control and designing the right things that will benefit everyone. Thinking about what AI can do for us, first and foremost, uh, is, is a good way to start. Um, you know, building these technologies like LipNet uh, that have a greater accuracy of reading lips uh, for those who cannot hear well, um, that's an amazing thing, right? And it learns along the way so that you, know, you have something that's, as we talked earlier, augmenting our capabilities, helping us. Similarly, the Horus technology, which uh, looks at the world for someone who has sight problems and describes what's around them uh, in their ear. These are the ways, I believe, that we should start fundamentally thinking about AI. How can it help the humans? There's a lot of concern about automation and jobs going away with AI. <coughs> And again, I think this is where augmentation is the way to think about it. Uh, because you know, combining our intelligence, combining our emotional intelligence, and our decision-making abilities with smart machines, that's really the better strategy than automation. This is also from the uh, CEO of TaskRabbit. It's really hard to turn a human being into a machine, because people aren't machines. The true specialized services that people need to provide will still continue to be provided in a very flexible way as part of what we call today as the sharing economy. So again, we're not replacing humans. We're helping humans. We're helping us. We're helping ourselves. We need to go beyond gimmicks. Uh, not to necessarily put down uh, this interesting concept from a Japanese hotel in Nagasaki. Uh, who is trying to essentially staff their hotel with robots. Um, I'm not quite sure if the, is that a, no, it's not a T-Rex. What is that? Does anyone know? Velociraptor. Velociraptor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting, and, and she actually, you can kind of tell if you look closely, she's also a robot. Um, which is interesting, uh, I read some reviews of, of this hotel, and it actually didn't work. Right, so the guy came in, tried to check in, and uh, the, the you know, human who had to still be there to check them in because the robots didn't work. They were there, they were ready, but their voice recognition uh, and image recognition wasn't working. So we have to be really careful about gimmicks. Next slide, please. Is this better? Uh, this is the Radisson Blue Hotel. Um, also thinking about robots for helping their customers. Uh, this one, you can text the robot, and unfortunately, he doesn't actually bring you what's needed, uh, but he does alert someone who will bring you something that's needed. So, you know, maybe still a little gimmicky, gimmicky but it's you know getting a little bit better. I think this is an interesting uh, perspective from Gartner. By 2020, the customer will manage 85% of the relationship with an enterprise without interacting with the human. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm poking a little bit of fun at these <laughs> hotels, but they're trying to hit this future that is coming, that is coming really soon, that is here. Uh, and they're thinking ahead. 
But really, I think the way to do that, next slide please, is starting with what's useful. User experience, people talk about usability. You know, what's, what's useful, uh, utility, uh, certainly as well as emotion. But I think the bottom line of starting with things that can help you. Uh, this is a startup uh, called Ava that, you know, allows you to use image recognition to take a picture of whatever it is you're eating and then um, has a massive database of all of the calories uh, and nutritional information of the food on your plate, regardless of what it is. So, you know, that, that's something I almost don't want to become available to me because I think I might become a little obsessed. But, you know, it's, it's actually a pretty simple and useful to many people idea. Process improvements, I think, are a huge one. Um, I was really fascinated to hear about um, this AI program uh, developed that has been uh, proven capable of predicting the outcome of human rights trials with 79% accuracy. That's fascinating to me. That's the power of being able to grab all of this massive amount of data that no human could consume. Uh, just consume, let alone analyze and come up with insights on. And I think what's interesting as well about this particular use case is that um, they don't believe that AI will be able to replace human judgment. But it can help prioritize court cases and determine you know, which ones are the most important to get in front. And that is, a, a, is something that could really be useful. So how do we avoid the gimmicks? Well, I think the best way to do it is to think about the services that AI can provide and get in a service mindset. Visual listening uh, is something that's definitely you know, out there and people are using this right now uh, as a service for businesses. Being able to understand what your customers are saying about you, uh, not just in a textual way, but in a visual way. Uh, I think that dog is smiling and is therefore happy about that Sierra Nevada. It's a little hard to tell though. Providing help. Uh, and I think this is a really interesting case where you know, I don't think that customer service entirely will be replaced uh, by AI, but we can uh, use humans and our brains to satisfy the tougher uh, nuanced details and you know, take advantage of AI to provide maybe that, that lower level uh, customer service. Um, and therefore, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me to think about even as a customer service person, I started my career actually as a customer service person at, the, at Amazon. And you get, you know, I swear nine out of 10 or maybe even, you know, 95 out of 100 calls were all the same. Where's my stuff? Where's my stuff? Can I do a return? Where's my stuff? And then got really, really boring. But it was actually super, super fun when that one lone person called with an interesting challenge or an interesting question or an interesting problem for me to solve. And I really actually loved my job at that point. You know, I was a customer service rep. So think about that. You know, think about how we can, uh, you know, again, instead of true automation, augmentation, we can have things like chatbots help from a you know, customer service uh, perspective at the lower levels, if you will, and allowing the humans then to really shine and really have, you know, have fun and, and show their, their intelligence in, in the best possible ways. Next slide, please. <coughs> Easing interactions, too, I think is, is a great area to consider. Um, this is Melody, um, created by Battery Research. And, you know, I like their perspective. Um, they want to provide patients with an online experience that is close to a human conversation. We believe this natural type of interaction will help patients feel more comfortable with their doctors. The thing that struck me as I was thinking about this particular example is that how many of us don't even like to go to the doctor, don't like to contact the doctor, don't want to talk to the doctor, might be fear, we might be a little intimidated. Think of how much faster many of us would ask a question digitally, especially if we're going to get a smart response. Uh, and you know, I start to think about what that does from a preventative care standpoint. And I think that sort of thing could be really useful, that sort of service, not just sort of replacing you going to the doctor, but providing that sort of easier entry into asking questions 
um, that you're scared to ask about, maybe embarrassed to ask about. You know, a lot of people don't want to go to the doctor because they feel embarrassed about a problem they're having. So they can have this sort of easier entry point um, that can then escalate, you know, if there is potentially a problem and say, hey, you know, you really should go to the doctor. Predictions. Predictions are all everyone's talking about right now. You know, whether or not um, Amazon provides its, you know, drone delivered uh, predictive shipping in the near future, you know, there's obviously lots and lots of predictive analytics happening right now. Uh, predictive messaging, um, you know, predicting trends and creating products based on those trends, predictive fraud alerts, maintenance, hiring, the list goes on and on. And I think it's interesting um, in this one study, 72% of U.S. millennials believe that as technology develops, brands will be able to accurately predict what products they want. So that means that at least the younger generation, if you will, um, seems to be pretty ready for this idea of, of predictive intelligence and getting things maybe even before they thought they wanted them. Or it could just be entertainment. This is my husband. The other night, uh, he came home. We have an Alexa. And he came home and he said, okay, I'm not quite sure why. He came home and he said, Alexa, put on your red shoes and dance with me. And what was interesting is that literally that song started playing. And I've decided it's an Easter egg because we spent the next three or four hours <coughs> quoting song lyrics to Alexa, and not a single one hit the song. Yeah. Alexa just either kept saying, I don't understand your question, or it made that little sound <laughs> noise that it makes when for some reason it's tired of you and, and uh, you know, sick of you. I, I guess the uh, AI itself not working, or the voice uh, recognition not working, was an entertainment of itself. But I have to say, it was, it was pretty fun when he came home because he just talks to Alexa, you know, I don't know, expecting what she's going to say back to him, uh, maybe, so that he doesn't have to talk to me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, 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 was a, it, was a bit, it was that moment of surprise and delight when she just started playing the song that he was talking about. Next slide. So the next thing we have to do is, you know, get off our butt uh, and think about these technologies. Next slide. Uh, think about how do we use our fridge. This is, you know, we shouldn't be sitting in front of our screens. We should be uh, using transportation um, and thinking about, you know, in order to build these experiences, get out there and start physically doing things and thinking about how things can help. We also need to tell the story. Next slide. Close your eyes. Think about what AI can do. I had a story to read for you, but we started a little late, and so I will let you instead imagine what AI can do for you. Telling that story and thinking about how it can help you um, and how it can help everyone is a great way to really think about how it can uh, positively impact you. Be careful to not view it as a prediction, though, because those often don't go well. But telling the story, whether it's visual, uh, mapping out the customer journey, these tools that customer experience professionals often use, this is a really critical way to understand the best ways that AI can be part of your life. Co-creating, creating with customers, creating with stakeholders are important things as well. Ethics, obviously huge, huge part of it. Um, excited to see that uh, there's a talk this afternoon about this. Um, I think this is where the fear comes from, but if we really steep ourselves in thinking about the ethics, that's very important. And we have to stay flexible. I don't know if anyone's seen this. This is the 98-year-old uh, yoga, uh, former yoga teacher here in New York. It's amazing. I want to be able to do that when I'm 98. Uh, and really, you know, for those of us like me who've been in uh, this digital world for a very long time, we need to stay flexible. It's not about screens anymore. Um, it's not even about necessarily devices, right? We need to be able to design these experiences that may interact with us in any way, including within ourselves. And finally, we need to remember the big picture. This will change retail. This is the uh, North Face Watson Empowered Tool. Um, and uh, the, the head of 
uh, Digital at North Face says this is unprecedented. We think this is game changing. It will change entertainment. Uh, virtual uh, reality and gaming is, is going to completely change. Imagine a true choose your own adventure type gaming experience where everything changes as you go through it. As we all know, this is already changing medicine in terms of being able to uh, recognize patterns on x-rays faster and more efficiently than any human could. This will change education. Uh, Sesame Street is, is already working with Watson and, and Bill Gates is super passionate and has talked a lot about where AI can help. It will change cities. Uh, starting already, you know, smart stoplights, smart garbage trucks, smart streets, smart parking. It'll change warp. This one I think is interesting. The DARPA agency has funded projects that involve implanting chips into soldiers' brains that could one day enhance performance on the battlefield. They were quick to say they haven't done it yet, but they're thinking about it. So I think as we all know, that's why we're here today, this will change the world. And while there's a potential to abuse these technologies, we shouldn't let that scare us. We should be thinking about how they can help us help the human uh, so that we can really truly leverage technology. These are the eight tips that I spoke about. Thanks very much.